Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Giorgio Constantin Constantinos from um, the University of West Macedonia in Greece. And uh, while we were waiting, I just asked him if he was actually in Greece, which he is. And I just, it's just so wonderful to be able to speak to people all over the world through, through, through having this facility online. It's one of the advantages of it, really. Um, I'm sure there are disadvantages too, but it's great to hear other voices. Uh, so, um, Giorgio is going to, the title of his talk is Irreconcilable Languages, Extending the Dialogic and Imagination About Autism Inside and Outside the Clinic. So, over, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. So I, I would like to say that I feel very, very much excited for having the opportunity to, to share these ideas and my, the actual uh, research that I did in uh, United Kids several years ago. So while diversity and inclusion has been at the core of autism studies for many years, the two terms still remain uh, relatively uncharted, both within the psychotherapeutic literature and within autism studies. In the case of autism, diversity is mainly expressed through the idea of being neurologically different, being neurodiverse. Neurodiversity has become equivalent to social resistance against the colonization of autism through disabling rhetorics. However, as I will try to show today, being neuronally diverse cannot and does not efficiently alleviate the anxieties of the autistic population generated by the fear of being socially ostracized due to continuous disablement. My presentation will emphasize the political arrangement between autism, psychoanalysis, and human diversity, while examining inclusionary and exclusionary discursive practices as this tend to materialize in the social life of autistic people. Data and findings included are derived from my PhD research held in the University of Hertfordshire. One of the main derivatives of this study is that the language of the clinic and the language saturating autism activists have become impenetrable to each other. They have become irreconcilable languages. Irreconcilability represents the cutting together apart to borrow the astonishing metaphor from Karen Barrett's agential realism, which occurs when one tries to compare the clinical and the non-clinical language surrounding autism spectrum. So this presentation will unfold into three main parts, three main movements. The first part will be a report of the main findings of a critical discursive psychological study that took place in the British territory. The second part will present the results of an eclectic multimodal discourse analysis of an activist video on the popular social media of YouTube. The last part will be a lively performative discussion that will take place as an imaginary conversation between the two studies. Far from being artificial, the dialogical activity presented could be thought as a site of social and thus political configuration, a place that is crafted by multiple discursive positions situated, situated within the current historical habitus. The analysis of the data sample centered upon an inconsistent discursive arrangement. On the one hand, the data revealed the homogeneous construction of autism as a pathological entity which on the other hand was contrasted by representation of autism as variable and also unknowable. The discursive activity of the therapist mobilized the framework of moral necessities that the person living with autism should internalize for escaping social mobilization. Within this notably dilemmatic framework, four main in interpretive repertoires were identified. The first repertoire, conflated autism is a very delicate subject position. To their talk, most of the therapists emphatically, emphatically framed autism as an enigmatic form of life, which lacked ontological clarity. Autism was crafted through a political agenda that on the one hand contested the mainstream diagnostic classification, while on the other promoted the psychoanalytical views about autistic pathology. The second repertoire depicted autism through a particular set of language which emphasized the disorderly nature of autistic interpersonal functioning. Through the different safety continuum, the therapist offered a pervasive representation of autism as a pathological reaction to the external environment. This repertoire 
emphasized the interactional barriers put by autistic individuals, which were colored as dysfunctional personality attributes. Autism in this sense was considered an allergic reaction to change and sociality, which has become detrimental to the developmental trajectory. The third repertoire circulated the notion of autism as a disordered state of being, offering a different action orientation within the therapy's talk through a notably dehumanized linguistic framework. This repertoire was carefully assembled through metaphors of urgency, life, and death, and a, gen and a generalized notion of autism as toxic both for the self and its social surroundings. Finally, the fourth repertoire evolved within discrete scenarios of impairing embodied materiality. The autistic body became a point of ideological imperialism through the image of the damaged corporeality, giving the opportunity to the therapist to pronounce his or her politics of normative proprioception. The multimodal discourse analysis employed as the second study was very apocalyptic for the way the activist assembled the various meaning-making resources to flexibly pronounce a palette of identities. The YouTube video became a kind of cinematic manifesto, which I will describe in the context of three interrelated nexuses. The first nexus encapsulated the activist's effort to negotiate her identity in a disability-free manner. Resistance in this context seemed to be deployed through a complex strategy. Initially, it was displayed through a range of everyday activities, such as caressing the keyboard or typing to a computer. The emphasis in these frames was in providing a naturalistic contour, but at the same time in legitimizing the use of everyday objects through focusing on their diverse set of affordances. Generally, by placing these actions in her private domestic space and directing them through an amateur film discourse, the protagonist framed her identity as authentic and thus real. Having already disclaimed her disabled image, the protagonist then synthesized a series of actions that attended to disability as a property of the social rather than the individual territory. The artistic orchestration of the reading action, coupled by the playful activity towards a female necklace, framed the ideological orientation of the activist. While both of these actions appear artistic key to the wider neurotypical audience, they were multimodally managed with such a mastery, which effectively overshadowed the unwanted identity properties. Most importantly, the actions performed revealed how everyday objects, such as the book or the necklace, through their historical and cultural significations, can become a vector of disability for those bodies that fail to reciprocate for their sensory motor affordances. In this vein, it could be supported that every single body that participates in the social world without conforming to neurotypical forms is potentially half-fabled, half-disabled. Finally, the last nexus through its documentary layout, it layout, its written and spoken narrative, and the authoritative discursive content acted as a complex interactional space where the performer set up a moral dichotomization to the YouTube audience, asking them, are you with me or are you against me? By attending to the political dynamic of microfascism, the author of the video recycled the established power dynamics of the autism activist movement by resorting to oppositional and thus polemic rhetorics. The result was the split of the social world that took place through a complete departure of, from the neurotypical, ontological, and philosophical framework. How are we therefore to understand the interplay between the two studies? The answer could be approached by relying on a playful imaginary conversation among the two social actors. This dialogue will be deployed here as unique conversational acts corresponding to three axes of irreconcilability. The first axis. The unknowability of autism invoked the dismantling of the autistic subject. Yergio stated that to be autistic is to exist in an in-between space. It is about slipping self-categorization and be deprived of the need for self-knowledge. Unknowability in the discourse of the analysts provoked the disintegration of the autistic body while accelerating the governing of the self through psychological colonization. The therapist seems to place, seem to place the rhetorical activity within the cultural premises of biopower 
which frame a constant demand for the becoming of the self. The oppositional dialogical template in the first axis was established upon the activist's attempt to craft a resilient identity through the dynamic of conflict. Conflict, however, invokes power. It also gives life to a battle for self-other recognition and empowerment through the radicalization of action. The therapist discourse was attended and then responded as an ongoing assault upon autistic individuality. The product of valued, disability-free identities produced by the activists, therefore, could be interpreted as a kind of fighting back in order to seek recognition and self-restoration. The second axis of irreconcilability set settled upon the notion of security and once again was discursively sustained by both sides. On the one hand, the therapist highlighted the predominance of the defense, defensive character of autistic life, which leads to a world of a dead inequality. On the other hand, the activist resorted to, self, to the self-disclosure of her private life to show that there is nothing hidden. The second irreconcilable scenario is again profoundly oppositional. The languages of the therapist and the activist appear locked inside the conversational scenario fueled by their wish to exert power on each other. Benjamin argued that social actors can become enslaved in this interpersonal dynamic, which is built on the premises of the imposition of power. The malignancy talk finally has been paramount inside the therapist's narrative. The questioning of vitality of autistic life frame a delicate way of, way of being for the autistic population, asking them to surrender to the therapeutic remediation, which could, could then alleviate their autistic states instead of living their lives under the danger of becoming societal zombies. Once again, the dilemmatic framework posed by the therapeutic culture elicited a dual done to response constituted by the attempt of the activists to deepen the relational chasm from the neurotypical population. One of the phrases that seemed to epitomize the protagonist's political agenda was, I'm just interacting with the water as the water interacts with me. Within this sentence, the activist seems to crystallize her view of, of her identity as one that does not follow the conventional symbolic understanding of the world. The attempt to escape the social apartheid created by the language of the clinic was meant by the angry protest of the activists leading to further segregation and further isolation. It seemed that there was not es no escape from this conversational dynamic led by both social establishments. One of the most just important- one minute, Con Constantine, you just have one, one minute. One of the okay. most important findings addressed by this study is that the clinic and the outside the clinic the autistic and the non-autistic, the normative and the disorder provide the boundaries for autistic individuality. These boundaries function as fencing that talk about autism, segregating the social terrain in an us and them modality. Thinking autism outside this dilemmatic configuration becomes impossible. One can neither inhabit the space of pathology or escape through the diversity flagship. The notion of diversity, however, in the case of autism, creates the tyrannical compulsion of using a pronoun-dependent social diplomacy as exemplified in the us or them relationality presented. There is then an apparently an urgent need to engage in pronoun-free politics if we are to exit this cold world discursive arrangement, opening up new inclusionary avenues. Thank you, thank you. Um, shall shall we go back to the main screen? Can 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 you? I'm trying to do this. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't think I can. I can. Um... We can leave it. <laughs> ah, there we go. Well done. That's great. Thank you very much for that, Constantine. Um, uh, I I thought those comments with the therapist and then the the, pers the person in the, the clinic and the experience, if you like. I, I, to me, that was just so stark in illustrating um, so much of what we've been talking about already, I think. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, so any questions? We have a few minutes for questions or comments. 
Yeah, could I make a comment or a couple of comments? I, I really like the idea of indigenous language, you know, and in a way, isn't that what psychotherapy is about as well? Learning to understand how another person understands the world, you know, and that nice thing of lived interactions with objects, you know, um, there's a whole kind of sensual relation with water, isn't that going on there? That probably someone who isn't autistic would never understand or never get. But um, it's a nice way of looking at things differently. You know? Thank you for your talk. It's really good. Thank you for your comment. So that, that reminded me, um, but both of you, of this idea of a culture of one. We locate culture in, in many other places, but forget this notion of the culture of one, which is, to, I, I think, speaks with what you're saying, Tony. Um, anyone else? Can I just say, Georgie, I loved your methodology. I loved the dialogue between those two discourses. I think it's brilliant to illustrate it. And I'd I'd love to know if you send if you would send your dialogue to the person who made the YouTube video and see what they make of it. Yeah, that, that was that was one of um, our main uh, things to do. Uh, we were unlucky that we didn't manage to do it because the the time frame. Uh, I I didn't manage to stay within the time frame because it was very uh, combining the two the two study was very demanding and very demanding process. But this is something that I'm intending to do uh, in the future. So it's, it will be very interesting to think uh, with this woman posting the video about our own interpretations and um, uh, the way that this interpretation function to her uh, her viewpoint. I was also going to ask you if you wouldn't mind posting the link to the YouTube video in the chat so we can access it. Yeah, I, thank you. Watch I, will it. it. I will post it to the chat, yes. Thank so. you. I would, I would love to spend time just looking at that dialogue again, really. I know I haven't got time now, but it's, uh, there's so much you had there. But, uh, um, it's, I, it's an example of how, of how, how I, at the actual dialogue, the actual you know, world of someone's experience, as far as we can represent it, says so much more than, than anything else. Sorry, sorry Della. No, I was curious how, to what extent has your presentation and thinking been influenced by your music? It is very much, uh, yeah, very much influenced by my, by my musical background, because if you, if you also see the video, uh, the woman posting the video uh, incorporated a very, uh, very interesting musical background. Actually, it was her uh, voice singing a very interesting uh, simple melody and i think mu music uh, influences all of my thinking because uh, <laughs> it allows you to think outside the way that um, words function so it is about uh, finding your own musicality and the musicality of the dialogue that makes the difference and i think this is very 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 uh, important uh, in working with people that does not share the same language with us. So that creates a very, very active bridge and a very, very, uh, it restores our access, I think. Yeah, yeah. It provides a different access. Raises the yeah. question whether you can make music together. Exactly, exactly. Can I have time for just one very quick comment or question? Or maybe not, the, the time just suddenly went. <laughs> um, so I, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll leave that there. And th thank you again, Constantine. Thank you very much for that.